Hello, good afternoon for people living in Europe and Africa. Good morning for people living in America and good night for people who live in Australia, New Zealand and so in Asia. I'm very happy to introduce our international webinar about the Value Reporting Foundation, a presentation to the Italian context. And thank you very much for you all to be here today with us. So I will introduce you some remarks of our webinar through some slides that will be offered to you. And the first one shows what our foundation is, because many of you perhaps already know that our foundation is a legally recognized foundation open to many participants, to all participants that would like to join us. It's a market-led organization open to all stakeholders that would like to join our foundation. It is it's not closed. It is inspired by an, inclu an inclusive approach. He, and our foundation has an articulated governance able to guarantee all the interests that we have at stake. We are no profit entity. We have no commercial engagement. And we would like to, op to operate and to work just for the public interest. And then the next one. Uh, we have born. We, we have born on June uh, 2019, 11 of June. But our origin is before, because we have a, an organization, as you an IBR, founded on February 2012, and we our issues we deal with issues related to reporting, to disclosure information about sustainability. ESG, climate change, non-financial reporting, intangibles, intellectual capital, integrated reporting and governance, and also integrated thinking. We have about 60 members. We, have, we are open, I said, 60 members of our foundation, going from the large listing companies to small, medium enterprise, university, university departments, academics, single persons, professional managers, and many other consulates, financial analysts, and so on. But we have 60 members in the foundation, but hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders all around the country and in the world. Since our establishment, the OIBR has been supported officially, and we are happy about that, and recognized by the IARC, by the SAS, by the Global Re Reporting Initiative. And uh, we, we wish that the new fun value foundation, the new value reporting foundation will continue with this collaboration with us. We do hope so. We also represent the Italian jurisdiction of the Wiki Global Network, and we are a member of IRRC Council as observer. We have an observer status. The next one, thanks. And uh, our aims are to promote studies, researches, guidelines, the dissemination of guidelines. We promote conferences, webinars, seminar, meeting, experience exchanges. And we would like also in future to write and to collaborate in writing principles and standards and to disseminate also principles and standards with a technical based orientation. In which field? In the field of business reporting, of non-financial disclosure, sustainability, integrated reporting, climate um, recommendation, and intangibles related information. This is our aim. This is our aim. And if you look at what we have done in the past, we have done many, many, many conferences. I don't, I don't quote all of them because there are so many, but I, I can suggest to people who don't know us very well, to look at our studies and guidance. you find some of them here, but you can download them from our website. And in particular, the next one, please, uh, the, 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 the guidance about the integrated reporting and how to promote integrated reporting amongst uh, mid-million enterprises, offering an implementation guidance. We have the idea to translate the English version of the implementation guidance into the Italian language, but we did more than a simple translation. We tried to adapt it to the Italian situation to, to, to render it much, much more effective. And then more something else. 
We have also some new uh, ongoing researches and uh, related working groups. For instance, we have performance measure, measure, measurement and SDGs the working group, non-financial information and forecast of enterprise crisis, operation, operationalization and materiality. And so we are working about that, about integrated reporting and non-financial information in the public sector. We would like to do also these new working groups. We are thinking about new working groups, ESG information, governance, executive compensation, biodiversity and corporate reporting. Uh, we, we plan to do that, but now we are working hard to get these purposes together. The next one, thank you. And uh, we have some initiative or collaboration with the Joint Observatory on Benefit Companies, Accountability and Impact with us a benefit. We have the Integrated Thinking as SMEs with the South African Institute of Chartered and Accountant. Even if we are Italian, we collaborate all, all over the world. And then, this is recent news, very good. Laura Girella and another, and another people, uh, that is Grazia Di Quanzo, has been uh, appointed in the Secretariat of a new effort, European Sustainability Reporting Standards. So we can follow closely also this work to be much effective, much more effective. And we have a special collaboration, we know, with the IRC. And OIBR has just completed the translation in the Italian language of the 2021 version of the integrated reporting framework. And we would like to present, to introduce, and to have a webinar presentation to the Italian companies in July, I hope, or recent, or in future, not, not, not so far, but we would like to do it soon. Thank you. And the other, the other one, please. And our governance, we have a very articulated governance because we have a general assembly of founders and members. We have we are an uh, open foundation, I say. And then we have a management council assisted by our secretary general, Stefano Zambon, that you, every one of you very, knows very well. We, that we have a supervisory council, a scientific committee, a council of statutory auditors and international observers. We'd like to have a, a very open governance, to be transparent, to be open to everyone. And through this open go governance, uh, we, we manage all the seminar, the webinar that we have done. Now, we have to arrive at the closing of my short speech to today's webinar. Why today? We would like to introduce the new Value Reporting Foundation, and we have here Janine Guyot to explain and to present it, to introduce the new international framework of integrated reporting. And we have Lisa French to present this framework to discuss the application and the perspective of the IR framework and the SASP standards in Italy and their alignment with the new EU direct directive proposal. We have Laura Girella to propose this part of the webinar and to stimulate a debate amongst company, authorities and universities and NGOs about the near future of sustainability reporting. And we have Guglielmino Nofri of Consul, Camillo Greco, CFO Post Italiane, Gianluca Manca, Head of Sustainability of Horizon Capital, and Franco Filippi of CADAF, uh, Water Utility SME, coordinated by Luca Grassadonia, that is member of the member of our foundation, besides many other things. You can pass to the last one, so we can say every one of you is 10 minutes are finished for me. I wish you all a very, very nice webinar. And my speech is closed, and so I will offer the possibility to join us to Janine Guyot, which is a, a very important person. Janine is the CEO of the Value Reporting Foundation, uh, and will Value Reporting Foundation CEO, and will introduce a presentation of the Value Reporting Foundation. You are in the States, you are early in the morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for you, Janine. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. I'd, I'd like to thank Alessandro and Stefano and OIBR for all of the leadership work that you do on improving business reporting. And um, OIBR is a valued partner of both the IIRC and SASB and now the Value Reporting Foundation. And I especially want to thank um, 
OIBR for the role they played in translating the integrated reporting framework, which Lisa French will cover a little early, a little later. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce the Value Reporting Foundation to all of you. And if we go to the next slide, um, I want to talk about why IIRC and SASB decided to merge to form the Value Reporting Foundation. And we were reacting to three things in the environment. One was we heard very strong demand from both companies and investors to rationalize or simplify the landscape. We felt, and there have been many um, attempts at simplifying the landscape by mapping frameworks um, or, or trying to align frameworks, we felt that organizational consolidation was necessary to simplify the landscape. And we felt that the combined resources and relationships of IIRC and SASB would then create one strong global organization that could help simplify the landscape. Um, the other thing I should mention is that the organizations had similar roots and similar goals, and that made, um, it obvious that if organizations were going to merge in this space, um, IIRC and SASB were two logical organizations to merge. So if we go to the next slide, who are we? Um, and I wanna be clear that the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards still exist. Think of the Value Reporting Foundation as a holding company. It is one global organization with a unified strategy, a single governing board, but three principal resources or tools for both companies and investors. And those are the integrated thinking principles, the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards. And we aim to simplify, advance a simplified corporate reporting landscape by bringing together more closely the existing integrated reporting framework and SASB standards. And we are providing active support and we are participating in the technical readiness working group of the IFRS foundation as they aim to launch an international sustainability standards board. And we are very supportive of that effort. Go to the next slide. Our strategic goals are to evolve and align the integrated thinking principles, integrated reporting framework, and SASB standards. Um, I'm going to show you later how uh, they are closely aligned today, but we think they could be more tightly aligned or harmonized to make it easier for, for particularly businesses to use them. Um, we want to support adoption and use of all of these resources or tools by both businesses and investors. And very importantly, we want to demonstrate how their use informs decision making because reporting and disclosure is not an end in and of itself. It is a tool to improve decision making, and we want to demonstrate how um, how reporting can inform decision making and improve performance by both businesses and investors. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we're very focused on pursuing simplification of the disclosure landscape. Next slide. This is who we are by the numbers. There are 2,500 integrated reporting framework users around the world, over 1,000 SASB standards reporters. There are 75 countries in which the integrated reporting framework and or the SASB standards are used. Many leading com companies or, or businesses use both the integrated reporting framework and SASB standards together. Um, there are $72 trillion of assets under management and investors who support the SASB standards. And then both organizations have very strong networks. Um, IIRC has a very strong network in the form of the International Integrated Reporting Council, which uh, as Alessandra mentioned, OIBR is an observer to, 
And then um, SASB has a very strong investor network with our investor advisory group, which has 58 investors in 12 countries. So the combined networks of the two organizations are very strong and very complementary. Next slide. I want to talk about our people. Uh, we have nearly 80 staff, including secondees and consultants, and they have a range of skill sets. One of the things that is very interesting about when you think about integrated reporting or sustainability disclosure is that you need a much broader range of skill sets than traditional financial accounting. And so we have engineers, we have accountants, we have uh, a master's in sustainability, we have lawyers, we have all, a very broad range of skill sets, and our staff speak 17 languages and are located across four continents. So we feel like we're well equipped uh, for the task at hand. Next slide. So just to close on what the Value Reporting Foundation is before I dive a little deeper into our resources, uh, just to reiterate, we support business and investor decision-making with three key resources, integrated thinking principles, integrated reporting framework, and SASB standards. And these resources make it easier for businesses to communicate long-term strategy. That's a key word, long-term strategy, and provide a comprehensive view of corporate performance to investors and other providers of capital. So the two key words in that sentence are long-term and comprehensive. We really aim to provide tools to think about business performance more holistically and comprehensively than simply traditional financial performance. Next slide. So just to go a little deeper into what each of those tools or resources are, the integrated thinking principles drive an improved understanding of how value is created over time. The next slide. The, the integrated reporting framework guides effective communication about governance, strategy, performance, and prospects through a multi-capital lens. And the next slide, the SASB standards provide investors with comparable information on the sustainability factors most relevant to financial performance and enterprise value. Next slide. And so how do all of these fit together? And this is one of the things I am most excited about, about the merger, is that historically, the integrated thinking principles and integrated reporting have been positioned as very, very, very strong tools to improve business decision-making, management decision-making, decisions by boards of directors. And SASB standards have historically position, been positioned as a very strong tool to improve investor decision-making and have more, more uh, holistic investor decision-making. And then both organizations have been very focused on external reporting and reporting as a tool to create a common language and a shared understanding between businesses and investors about how value is created and preserved or eroded over time, and especially over long time horizons. So what I'm very excited about is we now have this robust tool set under one roof from end to end, tools to improve business decision-making, tools to support external reporting, and then tools to support investor decision-making. Next slide. And this, this is going to be illustrated very, very clearly next week. We are very, very excited to publish case studies on how businesses have found value through integrated thinking. And these are real life examples from our integrated thinking and strategy group that includes several Italian case studies, case studies from Italian businesses that I hope you'll find very, very useful, but really, really illustrating that front end of the process about how integrated thinking can improve decision-making by management and boards. Next slide. 
So I mentioned earlier that we want to make it easier for businesses to use the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards together. They are already complementary and they are very powerful when used together. And this is why the integrated reporting framework is industry agnostic, it's principles based, it provides insight into high level content elements that should be addressed in an integrated report. And it drives connectivity of what some people would call sustainability information and traditional financial information and issues like intangibles and how intangible assets are created and managed. So it creates that connectivity of information that has often historically been siloed in different parts of a company. The SASB standards are more detailed. They're industry specific, they're metrics based, they lay out specific disclosure topics and metrics to be covered, disclosed by specific industries, and they enable information to be compared across companies within a sector. So the combination of the integrated reporting framework, which provides high level guidance, and especially for qualitative disclosure about strategy and performance and prospects, combined with the more metric-based orientation of the SASB standards, those tools together are very powerful. If we go to the next slide, and as I mentioned, close alignment between the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards already exist. The integrated reporting framework is organized around the concept of six capitals, the SASB standards are organized around the concept of five sustainability dimensions. And you can see they're similar, but they're just a little different. So the integrated reporting framework uses the word natural capital. SASB uses the word environment. The integrated, they both use human capital. The integrated reporting framework uses the concept of intellectual capital. The SASB standards have many of those types of topics in business model and innovation. So you can see this is similar, but it's just different enough that if you're, you're a business trying to use these tools, this can be confusing and, and irritating. <laughs> um, and so we wanna bring these things together so they, they are the same and the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards fit together very neatly and very cleanly. And that makes it easier for companies. The next slide. This just goes into a little bit more detail about how the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards fit together. The integrated reporting framework provides very good guidance to talk about the external environment, governance, business model, risks, strategy, performance. And then the SASB standards, which are industry specific, then provide more detailed guidance on industry specific disclosure topics and metrics for use in an integrated report. And the benefit of that is it makes integrated reports more comparable for investors, which is very, very helpful. So then if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk broad, briefly about our role in the broader corporate disclosure landscape. And some of you may have seen this before because I think we did a webinar uh, previously on this concept of nested materiality. But there, and we laid this out last fall in a joint paper with several of our colleagues around the world who work on frameworks and standard setting. And we laid out this concept of nested materiality and that there are three types of information. So the inner box in this graphic, the smallest box, is traditional financial reporting, the information that's in the financial statements or the notes to the financial statements. That is the world of the traditional financial accounting standard setters like the IASB. Then the middle box is a broader set of information that provides insight into the performance on the sustainability issues that impact enterprise value. So long-term financial performance and enterprise value. That's the purview of the SASB standards. And the integrated reporting framework then provides a framework for connectivity between that traditional financial information, 
and the broader sustainability information that impacts enterprise value. And then the outer box here, the, the light blue box, is information about a company's impacts on society that is of interest to multiple stakeholders. That's the role that the GRI standards have traditionally filled. So we did this graphic with, with our colleagues around the world to really try to explain, create a common visual and common language for the sustainability disclosure landscape and be clear how we fit within it. So then if we go to the next slide, I just want to close on saying uh, we really do support efforts to create a comprehensive corporate reporting system. We have heard all of you who are confused and frustrated by the current landscape, and we are very, very focused on trying to simplify the landscape. If we go to the next slide, um, both what you can expect next is ongoing guidance on how to use the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards together. Um, as I mentioned, we want to more closely align the concepts in the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards. However, we do need to acknowledge that there is due process, and Lisa will talk about this. There is robust due process around both the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards. And so any changes have to go through that due process. And then you can expect you know, ongoing insights and case studies from us about how these resources influence decision-making. So to close, you know, both IIRC and SASB, if we go to the next slide, celebrated their 10th anniversary last year. And we have broke tremendous, both organizations broke tremendous ground in their first 10 years. And we are looking forward to what we can do in the next 10 years. Um, and I wanna thank all of you, all of you, OIBR and all of you who have played a strong, strong role in advancing corporate reporting. Uh, we have a very strong network of supporters around the world. And I just wanna acknowledge and thank some of those supporters who made public statements at the time of the merger. So uh, with that, Alessandro, I'm happy to hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine, Thanks, for your very effective presentation. With this strong presentation, with the comparison between the standards ESB, pardon, with the SASB standard and the IRC standard, there you answered too many questions you would like to pose. You have already answered to that this valuable presentation. So, thank you very much. We have time to then, in the conclusion, to to come back to all the arguments that you support. And so, thank you again. And so, we I offer the, the floor to Lisa Friend, that is Chief Technical Officer of your foundation, that is Value Reporting Foundation, to speak about the new version of the International Framework of Integrated Reporting, something that we'll present, introduce also in Italy and the Italian language soon. Thank you so much, Lisa, to be here with us. Well, it's a great pleasure. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. Uh, I wanted to thank OIBR for inviting me to speak today, uh, and it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you online. So if we can get those uh, slides up. And before we get into the real substance of my presentation, I just wanna to touch on some of, the, um, some of the features of the underlying framework revision process that we underwent uh, last year. Um, so, uh, over the course of, of two consultations, which collectively spanned 120 days, we heard from individuals and organizations across 55 jurisdictions. We held 25 virtual roundtables around the world, of course, with the OIBR hosting one of these events on our behalf, and this helped us to further extend our reach into the Italian market, so it was very much appreciated. Through these roundtables and online surveys, we received almost uh, 1,500 responses and contributions to the process, which reinforced the momentum for integrated reporting and strengthened our commitment to following a market-led approach. And finally, our framework board members logged considerable time, some 350 hours collectively, to review market responses and to consider the implications for the integrated reporting framework. So how was their time spent? Well, before we move on to the next slide, I should point out that there were three main objectives for the framework revision process. 
Uh, the first was to provide greater clarity to users of the integrated reporting framework. The second was to simplify matters for report preparers. And the third was to drive improved quality in integrated reports. And I'll return to these three objectives, clarity, uh, simplicity, and quality throughout my presentation. So let's see how the first objective, providing clarity, translated into specific framework enhancements. So as shown in the right-hand panel here, the framework now better distinguishes between business model outputs and outcomes. And that's because we saw weaknesses in this area of integrated reporting in practice. And so we better clarified the distinction between uh, outputs and outcomes, in part by ensuring that both terms are very clearly defined in the body of the text and not simply in the glossary. So this was a very easy adjustment, but hopefully quite an impactful one. More substantively, we've included a new illustrative example to show the difference between outputs and outcomes. Now, the example's short and sweet, but it does do the trick of linking the concepts of outputs and outcomes to a very accessible and a very real-world example. Finally, we strengthened figure two. This is a diagram that shows conceptually how an organization creates, preserves, or erodes value over time. So the diagram now applies a few visual techniques to more clearly differentiate outputs from outcomes. And I've isolated just the business model segment of figure two on the next slide. So we've applied different colors and shapes to really drive home the point that outputs and outcomes are in fact different concepts. While we were at it, we took some additional market advice to ensure that the way we illustrate outcomes perfectly aligns with the way that we define outcomes. So whereas the previous uh, integrated reporting framework and the previous diagram showed a simple linear progression through the business model components, we now show that outcomes can arise from both business activities and outputs. And I think that was a very important market observation and one that's now captured in this diagram. And finally, this portion of the diagram now reminds preparers that outcomes should be considered not just in the short term, but also in the medium and long term. Next slide. So staying with this theme of clarity, so the revised framework addresses some governance-related concerns that we've heard over the years. So first of all, we clarified the scope of the term those charged with governance to reflect that in some cases, an organization's governing body actually includes its executive management. And this is consistent with definitions found in assurance standards. And so many were pleased with this move to better align with those standards. Secondly, a new paragraph reminds organizations, regardless of their entity-specific governance model, of the intent of the statement of responsibility from those charged with governance. This new paragraph also provides guidance to businesses with two-tier boards. So all told, these changes leave much less to the imagination. Finally, we remove the required commentary on the governing body's application of its collective mind. The term collective mind confused some based on its subjectivity, so we removed the terminology, and in fact, we removed the required commentary altogether because many considered it to be redundant, and we agreed. Next slide. So we're going to shift gears now to efforts to simplify matters for report preparers, starting with the required statement of responsibility for the integrated report. And I referenced this briefly on the previous slide. Just by way of context, aside from a few jurisdictions, we've seen relatively limited uptake of this required statement of responsibility. So we had actually explored replacing the requirement with a different and voluntary approach. But the market pushed back on this proposal over concerns that the quality of integrated reports might suffer. So we explored other ways to simplify matters without sacrificing the goals of instilling accountability and fostering credibility and trust. And we did this in two ways. First, we removed the need to comment on future plans for a phase in of a statement of responsibility. Secondly, we acknowledged more explicitly that integrated reporting is a journey. And I know that that sounds cliche, but it is a fact that organizations adopt the framework's requirements over several reporting cycles rather than in just one year. So the framework now signals that, look, you don't have to be quote unquote perfect to be able to provide a statement of responsibility. 
In addition to these more substantive content changes, we've also looked at the framework's user friendliness. Next slide. So in terms of the integrated reporting framework structure and layout, we've shifted the general reporting guidance to its own clearly marked section in the framework. And overall, you will find a cleaner and more modern look and feel to the framework. Looking to the second point, for those using the electronic version of the framework, you'll find more hyperlinks to glossary defined terms. You'll also find it easier to navigate to and from related content within the body of the framework. And icons at the top of each page also ease some of the pain of flipping back and forth within the document. Next slide. So the third class of framework enhancements relates to the quality of reported information. And step one in our approach was reinforcing the need for balanced disclosures. So uh, this means acknowledging and candidly communicating scenarios in which value is eroded or simply preserved rather than created. And so we've dealt with the inherent bias of the term value creation by more frequently and more explicitly referencing value preservation and value erosion scenarios. We also encouraged preparers to communicate negative outcomes along with the positive. Of course, this encouragement was always in the framework, but we strengthened the message in two key places. And we'll see these in the next two slides. So next slide. So here we see that now familiar business model segment of figure two. And in that lighter blue outcomes component, you'll see a clear reminder that report preparers should address negative outcomes on the six capitals in addition to the positive outcomes. And you'll see on the next slide, a newly added example explicitly addresses both positive and negative outcomes. Now, staying with the theme of quality for just a moment longer, next slide. We reinforce the importance of robust reporting by encouraging supplementary disclosures on the reporting process itself. The rationale being that this provides insight into the integrity of the integrated reporting process. The integrated reporting framework also reminds preparers more purposefully that disclosures are most effective when they include a blend of qualitative and quantitative information or phrased differently, narrative and indicators or metrics. So the indicators provide support or evidence as well as a basis for comparison and the narrative provides the all important explanations and context. And so this just reinforces some of the key points that Janine made in terms of the merger between SASB and the IRC. The two refinements that are listed here support internal audit functions and third party assurance engagements. And they provide greater comfort to the governing body when it's providing its statement of responsibility for the integrated report. Next slide. So there you have it, the headline enhancements uh, in the 2021 integrated reporting framework. Uh, and these enhancements reflect the needs of both users and preparers of integrated reports. And though there are a few other tweaks, which we didn't touch on today, from the purely cosmetic to uh, the inclusion of terms such as purpose, which have become more pervasive in the business context, the changes largely fit into the categories of improving clarity, simplifying adoption and enhancing quality. And of course, you can learn more and access the 2021 version of the framework at valuereportingfoundation.org. Next slide. So I will just simply close here by saying it has been a great pleasure talking to you today. I know that was a bit of a whirlwind tour, uh, but it's been a, a pleasure to participate and I will close with a simple thank you to our host and thank you for those in attendance. Okay, we asked Lisa French something impossible. So to explain the new version of the international framework in few words, and she got the go. Thank you for explaining with clarity, simplicity, and quality these new issues. Thank you so much, Lisa, and nice to have you here. And uh, you stay with us, and then we go on. Thank you, uh, with Laura Girella, we, uh, with the application of the IR. IR framework and SSB standards in Italy and their alignment with the new UCRSRD proposal. I would like to make my compliments to Laura to be part of the Secretariat 
of the EFRAC. This is a great goal for her, for her and also for OIDEA. Laura, the floor is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Alessandro. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, today, I've been given the very uh, special task to provide you with an overview of what are the trends in Italy in relation to the adoption of the IA framework, SASB standards, and also what's going to be probably the future in relation to the alignment with the new EU uh, directive in relation to the corporate sustainability reporting. And possibly I'm going to try to do that in uh, uh, something like eight minutes. So if we would like to start with, uh, with uh, uh, an overview of what's the adoption of integrated reporting in Italy, what I can say is that uh, actually we don't have the big numbers, the huge numbers that maybe other countries have, such as, for example, in Japan, where uh, they have something like 400 organizations that adopt integrated reporting. But uh, uh, we have something that goes a little bit beyond numbers. That is uh, the type of organization that adopt integrated reporting because uh, uh, this type of this organization comes from a variety of sectors, some of which are very unexpected to see. Uh, here I try to uh, summarize a bit what uh, this variety is about. And uh, as you probably know, uh, one of the most unexpected cases of adoption of integrated reporting has been related to the uh, case of the uh, Cara di Mineo, which is uh, the largest center for asylum seekers, which is located in Sicily, and that for two years in uh, uh, 2015 and 2016 has decided to adopt uh, integrated reporting in order to explain not only uh, to investors, because actually there are no uh, main investors, but uh, in general to stakeholders, their value creation process. Another very special case is the one of our municipality, which is uh, uh, the uh, municipality of Sasso Marconi that uh, for two years have uh, decided to adopt integrated reporting. It is the second uh, municipality in the world that has started to do so. And then another unexpected case is the one of the Italian Federation of Football Federation uh, that has started since many years to adopt integrated reporting. So as you can see, a large variety of cases. And this variety of cases, if we go to the next slide, is also related to SMEs. As you know, small and medium enterprises represent the backbone of the Italian economy. And uh, these are two uh, very special examples. On the left -hand side, uh, one very new integrated report that has been uh, uh, released by GZ Calze. I just would like to draw your attention of the amount of revenues, which is 18 million revenues for the last year. And on the right hand side of the slides, you find the case of a micro company, Regulatory Pharmanet, that since three years has started to adopt integrated reporting. And in this case, we are talking about a micro company. It is enough to take a look at the amount of that turnover, which is only about 4 million euros. So as I said, a large variety of cases. If we go to uh, the next slide, we will see what's going to be uh, what's the case of the adoption of the SASB standards in Italy. Uh, as probably uh, you already know, and we'll be hearing a lot also during the roundtable, there are large listed companies that are in the process of have already adopted SASB standards. Here you can find some of the main examples, some of the major examples. But uh, let me allow me to say that actually uh, SASB standards are not only for large listed companies and not only for investors. And we will be hearing more during the, uh, the roundtable about the case of CADF, which is uh, an SME and it is a water utility. So as I said, uh, also in this case, we will be here that uh, actually uh, SASB standards, once again, are adopted by a large variety of organizations in Italy. If we go to the next slide, we will see what is the adoption of integrated reporting and SASB standards in relation to comply with an own financial statement. Uh, these are the last numbers that we have. And in particular, in 2019, uh, we have found that in order to comply with the EU non-financial reporting directive, there are around 20 organizations that have started, that have adopted 
uh, the IR framework and SASB standards either alone or also in conjunction with other framework and standards. Some of these organizations use both the IR framework and the SASB standards. Some of them are already that the ones that I showed you before, and some are a little bit new. And another interesting case that I would like to point out is that uh, some organizations that uh, have started to comply with the non-financial statement on a voluntary basis because they do not fall under the scope of the non-financial statement, they have started to adopt the IR framework in order to uh, guide the, this type of documentation. If we go to the next slide, we will see uh, what's going to be actually the future. So how the alignment, how is the alignment of the value reporting foundation, so the IR framework and the SASB standards with the new EU CSRD proposal, which, as you know, has been released uh, in April. And this is just a summary of some of the points, the major points of alignment that you can find in uh, the IR framework, SASB standards, and the new proposal of the CSRD. First of all is the language, because as you know, now the uh, CSRD has changed its name. It's not just about non-financial statement, but the focus is gonna be on sustainability reporting. And this is actually well aligned also with the language that uh, the Value Reporting Foundation is using. The second point is about the multi-capital approach. As you know, the directive focuses not only on ESG anymore, but it's going to be something like ESG+, plus because it's also incorporates intangibles. And as Janine has also pointed out before, this well aligned with uh, uh, the IR framework and the SASB standards. The third point is about the metrics, because actually uh, the directive, but even more the uh, sustainability standards that will be uh, soon released by EFRAG in Europe, uh, will try to uh, cover uh, both in terms of sector agnostic and sector specific KPIs. Moving to the reporting areas, these are, as I said, some point of alignment, both the IR framework, SASB standards and uh, its conceptual framework, as well as the SRD uh, directive, they reference to strategy, they reference to governance, business model, impacts and or outcomes using the IR framework language, risks and opportunities and outlook. And the last point, the very important point, is about actually the, the work that has been carried out both by the Value Reporting Foundation and uh, uh, in Europe on digitization. I would like just to zoom in a little bit if we go to the next slides on these last two points. So about the reporting areas, according to the uh, EU CSRD proposal, there has been to some extent an explosion of the, of the number of reporting areas. And here you can find a high level summary of those reporting areas that are aligned with uh, uh, the TCFD recommendations that are the ones that are um, underlined in green. And then in red, you will find those that align with the IR framework and the SASB standards. Just enough to take a look at this to see that all this is very much aligned. If we then go to the other slide, which is about the work that is being carried out uh, in Europe, but also at the Value Reporting Foundation point of view, is the one of digitization. Because as you know, uh, basically, the new uh, EU CSRD proposal calls for uh, actually the use of a single electronic reporting format in order to uh, reporting on sustainability related information. And actually, the Value Reporting Foundation, the idea is to all the 77 SASB standards to be converted into IXBRL taxonomy and actually our public consultation on the drug taxonomy and preparer guide and supplemental material had just been closed on the 3rd of May 2021. So just to conclude, as we said, the state of the art is quite uh, satisfying, but we will see that uh, actually in the future there is a lot to be collaborating on again in Italy in terms of uh, alignment, but also more in terms of adoption. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to you, Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. I, I think that from your presentation, it's much evident that Europe, and in particular Italy, it is much, much interesting for SAS Foundation, for the SAS, for the Value Reporting Foundation. And so 
I think that Italy must, must be studied much more. And we are here to offer the possibility to everyone to study, to have experience in Italy, and to discuss about the Italian experience. So thank you so much, Laura. The, the, the joint comparison between the Value Reporting Foundation and the proposal of a new directive is much interesting. Thank you so much. And so now we have to offer the, our audience the possibility to listen to our roundtable, a roundtable on Value Reporting Foundation Sustainability Information in the Italian Contest, chaired by Luca Grassadonia, that is a subject matter expert, CFA Charter Holder and Management Committee, and is member also of the OIBR Foundation. And uh, Luca, you have about 30 minutes, not more, 30 minutes to introduce Guglielmino Nopri, Camillo Greco, Gianluca Manca, and Franco Filippi. They are member of our roundtable. The floor is for you, Luca. Have a good job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as uh, my chairman said, I uh, would be the host of this roundtable, which is about uh, the use of sustainability information in Italy and the role of the Value Reporting Foundation, what that could be. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker, which is uh, Miss uh, Guglielmino Onofri, the director of the issuers information at uh, CONSOB. CONSOB is the Italian regulator of uh, financial markets. So please, uh, uh, Miss uh, Onofri, uh, uh, let, let us hear your views about sustainability information in Italy. Thank you. Uh, good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening. I don't know everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, very much uh, the OIBR and uh, uh, Professor Zambon for uh, uh, inviting me today. As CONSOB, as authority responsible for uh, the non-financial reporting, we follow with very interest the activity in the field of non-financial uh, reporting. So, uh, in my speech, I would like to give a brief picture of the Italian experience and the role of CONSOB as the supervisory authority responsible for this kind of uh, uh, reporting. In the first, uh, in the first uh, slide, please. So, in Italy, uh, sustainability reporting began in the 1990s, uh, when some companies started publishing uh, sustainability reporting uh, on a voluntary basis, uh, but the first legal requirement uh, for this kind of reporting was the non-financial directive. In, uh, this, in this slide, uh, I have outlined some of the main aspects of uh, the regulation and also the proposal for amendment formulated by the European Commission. I will not comment all of these aspects, uh, but I would like uh, to underline that under the new proposal, the European Commission intends to extend the scope of the regulation to all large companies and all companies listed on regulatory market with the exception of listed micro enterprises. In introduce more detailed reporting topics and the requirement to report according to mandatory EU sustainability reporting standards. The draft standard will be developed by EFRAG. The new proposal confirms also that reporting is based on the perspective of the double materiality. This focuses not only on how sustainability uh, factor could affect the company's performance, but also how the company activity can affect both society and environmental. This is a broader vision that the financial materiality under by I4S. In the next slide, there is a, a legislative decree that uh, transpose the non financial directive in Italy, and this legislative decree identifies the relevant public interest exceeding a certain dimension and uh, appoints CONSOB as the authority with the task of supervising compliance with the legislation. In compliance with this legislation, CONSOB uh, um, may uh, require company to provide information uh, documents, uh, meet with directors, audit firms, statutory auditors, managers, uh, carry out inspection. In addition, CONSOB uh, can also require 
amendment in the integration to the non-financial statement and impose administrative sanction. In this, uh, um, in this regulation, we specify that the audit assurance can be issued in the form of limited assurance or reasonable assurance. In the next, uh, in the next slide, I um, would like to uh, share some views because uh, we, uh, uh, for us, uh, non-financial information is uh, a is considered to be crucial for current and potential investors to understand how these factors could influence the economic and financial result that the company can achieve. And there is a clear link between financial, financial and non-financial information. Uh, so for this reason, significant integration in terms of supervisory activity is already taking place. Integration is present in the feature of the supervisory model on compliance with non-financial statement. The models mirrors that used for the supervision of the financial reporting listed by issuer. Integration is also present in the selection method that we use, which takes into account inputs from our financial supervisor to select the company. Uh, the, uh, the authority publish annually the criteria for identifying the companies to be monitoring. Last month, CONSAB disclosed the, select the selection criteria for non-financial statement published in 2020. As the previous year, particular attention is being paid to the risk of greenwashing. Council has taken a lot of initiative at the national level to facilitate the application of financial uh, reporting and to analyze our relevant aspects. We don't, we don't have time to go in deep detail of this uh, initiative. I put the strategic plan, some uh, warnings that we made to the market, and the declaration that we support the tax force on climate relating financial disclosure recommendation. These documents are uh, um, published on our website. Consob also is a member of the European Security Market Authority, the International Organization of Security Commission, and is uh, very important the role of this organi organization have in this uh, field. So, in uh, uh, the last uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, slide. Uh, so I would like to share a few thoughts about the voluntary application of the non-financial reporting. Although our legislation envisages a specific regime for the publication of non-financial reporting on a voluntary basis, so far very few companies have in fact decided to do this. For the, this reason, on the September to 2020, Consob launch a call for evidence to understand why companies were reluctant uh, to do this. The sum of the result, uh, the sum of the result is uh, also in our website, and from the consultation, it was clear that there is a strong support for the standardization of reporting methodologies. The majority of respondents. Uh, underline that the definition of common standards and uniform criteria would facilitate companies in the drawing up the non-financial statement. Also, simplify standard for the preparation of the non-financial statement by small or medium companies was uh, uh, was underlined, but all the response, respondents. There is, uh, in the uh, next slide, uh, we have a big picture about uh, the companies uh, that use uh, um, the standard. As uh, you know, uh, to give an idea of the numbers, in Italy there are approximately 200 companies that publish an annual non-financial statement. And in Consob we see that all of these companies use the GRI standard as the main reference framework. Some use this standard also in combination with other framework. Some listed companies refer to the integrated reporting framework and other uh, use SAS industry standard, especially in the financial sector. 
other framework use refer to the tax force on climate related financial disclosure recommendation um, uh, recently important international initiative has been launched to move towards a greater harmonization of disclosure of sustainability as explained before on the european front the new proposal of a corporate sustainability reporting directive envisage the adoption of a mandatory eu sustainability standard in september 2020 the five leading framework and standard setting organization announce a shared vision for a comprehensive corporate reporting system. The IFRS Foundation proposal to set up a sustainability board with the task of endorsing new sustainability um, reporting. The latest initiative, which is also the subject of this webinar, is the merger between the International Integrating Reporting Council and the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board to form the Value Reporting Foundation. The next slide please so as uh, the authority in charge for the investor protection concept welcomes convergence on the issues of sustainability that can improve the transparency of the information the greatest criticality, criticality remains that of making international initiative compatible with the perspective of double materiality envisaged by europe which is wider than that of financial materiality. There are many challenges in the immediate future that need to be addressed. Some of these I put uh, in my uh, last uh, slide. So they need to avoid the greenwashing trap, linking corporate sustainability reporting and financial information. The fact that the initiative international level needs to be co coordinated the need for uniform standard and the importance of comparable, consistent and reliable reporting. Finally, introducing a reporting and flexible approach for small and medium enterprises. So there is a lot of work to do and initiatives such as the one today are very welcome to bring us closer to our goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Nofri. It's been very interesting to listen to the point of view of the regulator. And now we switch to the point of view of a major issuer of uh, financial instruments. Let me introduce uh, you, uh, Mr. Camillo Greco, Greco, sorry, which is the CFO of Post Italiane. Post Italiane, the mail service of Italy, recent, recently privatized, also logistic company, investment company, so a judge or not of the financial markets in Italy, and also an early adopter of both the international report, uh, integrated reporting framework and the SASB standard. So Mr. Greco, now I want you to explain to us why did you use the SASB standards and the integrated reporting framework? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, the question and thank you for the panel for having uh, Post Italiane participating and thank you for the contribution of the previous uh, speakers. Look, uh, uh, you know, just to set the scene for the foreigners, uh, uh, Post Italiana is a 16 billion uh, euro market cap company, 18 billion US, uh, it has uh, revenues in excess of 13, 14 billion US dollars, uh, is 65% controlled by the Italian government and is 35% listed on the stock market and it is, uh, perceived in Italy, as the uh, gentleman just said, as a systemic, uh, systemic player for the country, involved in a number of uh, strategic sectors uh, for, for, for Italy. So uh, uh, as a result of, uh, of you know, this uh, uh, context, contextualization, uh, it was uh, almost uh, a, a given that uh, a post Italiane would have, uh, as early as realistically possible, uh, adopted best in class uh, uh, reporting uh, reporting standards and it is exactly what uh, what we have done if uh, uh, the colleagues from the uh, back office can move to the first slide please uh, here you go so so what you will see is that we were you know an early adopter already in 2012 we started publishing a sustainability sustainability report in 2018 we moved uh, immediately to to pick up on the decree which was mentioned before, the 254, 
to start to provide a sustainability report or with also NFS related information. And as of 2019 for 2018 fiscal year, we have started to uh, publish an integrated report that has been ever increasing, ever increasing since in terms of content and in terms of information. Uh, just to give you a couple of of, of data points, uh, you know, I have here the annual report of Post Italiane. You know, this is a, a, a nimble, uh, nimble paper of 880 pages, I repeat, 880, uh, of which uh, 370, 370 are a combination of financial and non financial information, i.e., the integrated report we talked about before. It's a little piece of work that takes 100 individuals from our organization, from everything from corporate affairs to accounting, financial planning, and individuals from every uh, relevant BU of the group, and we do have four. Uh, and uh, we, we target something like more than 250 different indexes, 250, uh, which, are, which are relevant from ESG, to uh, any other of the targets we have given, we have given to the market. So this is like a major uh, operation that we conduct every year, and we think is is consistent with uh, uh, the standing that uh, Post Italiane plays uh, plays in uh, in the country. So let's please move ahead to the next page. So so here you go. So what you have here is that you have a table of contents of some of the topics we do address in an integrated. Uh, integrated way, you know, are, are nine different subjects. Some of them are uh, frankly intuitive, like introduction, highlights. But what is important is that, you know, when we start to refer to performance outlook and other information, also all the non-financial indexes that, that we target uh, are also part, part of that, uh, part of that uh, exercise. And I'll say more in the following, in the following slides. Um, please, let's move to slide number three. So, so here you go. So here, here what we wanted to signal to, to the audience is that we do try to take on the best, best of breed in terms of taking on input from different associations, foundations that have uh, contributed to the, to the uh, crystallization of the standard for the integrated report. Uh, we are in our uh, third, uh, third session, and I think what, what I want to uh, signal here is that uh, our uh, maturity level uh, is, is increasing. You do see it in bold at the end of, of, of the strap line at, at the top of the page. Uh, why our maturity level is, uh, is increasing and how can we sort of uh, credibly uh, sustain that uh, in, front, in front of you? Well, that's in page number, number four. Where, where what you see is that we have identified the six different types of capital that we aim to create value on. Obviously, uh, it's not only about uh, financials, but it's about uh, physical structure, intellectual, human capital, social relations, and natural capital. So what we do is that we have indicators for each of these six, uh, six forms of capital, and we benchmark them against what we call our eight pillars, which are the eight uh, pillars against which we, we, measure, we measure progress at, at Post Italiane. So, so you know, we, have, we have the framework of the capital, uh, we have the filter of the eight uh, pillars, and what's come out is the, is, is the outcome. The idea is that uh, you know, the outcome needs to be uh, value positive uh, on all of the pillars, and you know, that's the type of measurement that, that we do on our indicators we, we do that for the more relevant on a quarterly basis and for the ones that are sort of more directionally relevant we only target them once a year and again i repeat these are 250 different uh, different indexes uh, what does this uh, lead to which is the last page of my contribution uh, you know what does lead to is that obviously as far as uh, post italian is concerned inward inward looking this is a process of continued uh, striving for, for, for excellence. Uh, there is a large uh, working group uh, that uh, uh, works uh, on improving and year the integrated report, uh, but this has also had some benefits that go 
uh, beyond beyond uh, the company itself as in 2020 we we were awarded what you call in italy oscar di bilancio which is you know a attestation of the most comprehensive annual report for for italian large caps and we have been i would add rightly so included to a number of indexes that have characteristics uh, have characteristics of sustainability from bloomberg to S&P global FTSE for good uh, mss fi and uh, you know uh, dow jones so so this is something that you know we we also uh, consider a badge of honor uh, that we uh, share with investors and what i'll say uh, which i think again is, is relevant for for the audience is that uh, more and more when we interact with uh, institutional investors across the globe we are asked how we perform on non-financial targets uh, so so being able to showcase what we have done in this space uh, is sometimes just uh, value additive for us in other cases actually fundamental as there are investors which are prevented from investing uh, if, if we were not to have the infrastructure that that we have so uh, good luck for the rest of the uh, event and thank you again for having us thank you mr greco uh, again it's been very interesting to listen to the point of view of a um, major issue of financial instruments and we really hope that other companies will understand that the uh, non-financial information is important for investors too maybe following the example of post italiane and uh, talking about investors, let's move to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Mr. Gianluca Manca. Mr. Gianluca Manca is Head of Sustainability of, uh, at uh, Horizon, which is the biggest fund management company in Italy. And uh, Mr. Manca, let's tell us, uh, what do you think about sustainability information produced by Italian companies? Good day, everyone. And Thank you very much for this invitation, OIBR and Professor Zambon. Um, first, I would like to uh, say to those who don't know Horizon Capital yet that it is, it is the asset management arm of the Intesa San Paolo Group, uh, and it's been dealing with uh, sustainable investing since '96. Um, just to to clarify what this means, uh, in the early days of my fund investing in sustainability, I had to use uh, floppy disks from this uh, company that was called KLD. Um, and it was uh, one of the first companies in the world offering a service for information. I'm sure that the American friends uh, connected uh, to our webinar knows it. So now we moved from floppy disk uh, only uh, 25 years ago to the uh, European single access point that is basically the collector of all the uh, sustainability information that the European Commission is thinking of to let everybody, every company deposit this data for the benefit of any investor and, and every stakeholder. So we moved a long way from where we started. How do I see the situation in Italy? Uh, I must say that uh, Italy in the past uh, had um, experienced a gap. All of Southern Europe experienced a gap with the Nordic countries in the past. There was a cultural tilt <clears throat> that made the European Nordic countries more uh, inclined to invest uh, sustainably. But as has been already reported by many of the um, panelists before, with the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the uh, Sustainable Finance uh, Disclosure Regulation, the Ecolabel Benchmarking, the Taxonomy Regulation, all these pieces of legislation are pretty much putting everybody on an even plate. So I would say that while the Italian companies have started later to report, now they're doing an excellent job. There's a lot of them that started uh, pretty much like Poste, like seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh, some others are starting now, but I believe that they will have no escape now all over Europe because of the sustainable uh, finance uh, um, uh, disclosure regulation. Um, and this piece of regulation impacts uh, strongly the financial system. Why the financial system is clear because the commission needed to move private capital into the main green deal, into the pivotal shift towards a better and more sustainable Europe. And in doing so, they've engaged the financial system, uh, putting also the financial system into some um, critical um, condition because the financial system per se, take for instance, the asset management uh, sector where I come from, is both a preparer 
and a user. The same is for a credit institution, for instance. So the, um, it's a very delicate path, this one that we're going through, because not only we need to report what's happening in our company, but we need to report what happens in all the companies we invest in, all the companies that are part of our assets and that we invest in to, on behalf of our clients. So uh, I would say that um, we are seeing an enormous explosion of quality from the Italian companies to face the need for this enormous amount of data. Uh, I took notes from the other panelists to try and answer to them, but I also set up a timer, so I don't think I will have all the time that I want. But when I heard um, Mrs. Guyot uh, showing us the, the, the great numbers um, representing the new venture they're going through, um, I saw 2,500 uh, framework users, uh, 1,000 SASB reporters. And this tells us, uh, after we saw what the, C, um, the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive is about, tells us how long is the road to go because the uh, proposal uh, uh, for uh, this new package the legislative package the corporate sustainability reporting directive comprises now covers in scope 49,000 companies they seem to be a lot but they will all have to comply because of what we call the trickle down effect so once the first largest companies have been targeted now the scope is expanding but it would have expanded in a certain uh, way also if the uh, the number per se wouldn't have been enlarged because it's clear that when a company needs to report what they do in their supply chain they need to ask their suppliers to comply somehow to what they need so uh, th this is the first thing that I noticed. And another word that I heard from Mrs. Guyot which I really like very much is about long-term strategy and this is particularly important for asset managers. We know that uh, investors would like to have return in the short run uh, with the same consistency that is in the long run. So very often I'm asked as an asset manager if it's true that sustainable investing is more proficient in terms of bringing performance than other type of investing or less sustainable ways of investing. Well, what I always say is that this is a marathon. This is not a rush. And if we want to consider the long term, which also Mrs. Onofri talked about, if we want to consider long term, we need to settle down uh, this great pivotal shift. We need to absorb it. We need to start collaborating as OIBR is doing with other stakeholders and put into the same framework all our needs together to see how they can be combined for uh, the best of the financial and the economic community. Uh, I heard also Mrs. Girella talking about SMEs and she said how important SMEs are in this context because they need to report, they don't know how to do it yet. Why is that so? First, I would like to say that uh, the commission reports that 99% of all registered companies in Europe are considered small and medium enterprises. And they are basically the 66% uh, contributor to employment in Europe so almost 70% and 50% uh, of the GDP. What does this mean? It means that they cannot be left aside. So in uh, the, corpor the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, they are included, that they will be fully included in three years from now. And this is a very valuable uh, action and step towards the inclusion of the real economy represented in Europe by these companies. I also checked what happens in other countries like Japan, and it's pretty much the same. There is a percentage over 90%. So we need to involve SMEs. What is the problem of the SMEs today in investment terms? A lot of them, they don't produce a management report. And at the same time, EFRAG has established and advised the commission that the site for sustainable sustainability information needs to be the management report. So first, they don't have a site like larger companies. And they don't also don't have clarity in what they should report. This is why in a three-year time, we need to work also with Professor Zambon to try and analyze and understand what small and medium enterprises are entitled to report in a way that is uh, more um, less wide than large companies need to face themselves today. Uh, another thing that I, that I wanted to touch um, is about the SFDR, as I said before. SFDR is a, a prerequisite for 
for the world, I would say, to change the way we produce information. It is clear that the Commission has given us, as EFRAG, I'm, part of the, I'm honored to be part of the Project Task Force, has given EFRAG the uh, opportunity and also the, um, uh, the strict demand from the Commission to collaborate with all that is in place today. So uh, prestigious entities like the one that is hosting us today. And this thing, now it's the timer is gone, so I know that I have to stop talking. So basically what I wanted to say is that I have no doubt that we're going towards the right direction. Let's work on SMEs as well. Let's put everybody in the same table and let's make the world a little bit more transparent and uh, agile in terms of investing. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Manka. It's been uh, interesting again to listen to the point of view of the, the reader of uh, sustainability information reports. And now uh, let's move on to, let's turn it over to the last speaker of uh, this round table, which is uh, Mr. Franco Filippi, which is in the administration of CADF. CADF is a small water utility uh, in Italy, in, in the Northeast, and it's peculiar because they decided to report according to the integrated reporting framework, SASB standards, and also according to the non-financial reporting directive. So this is uh, one of the few examples of a company who decided to report voluntarily uh, following the EU directive. So up to you, Mr. Felipe. Why did you do that? Thank you, Luca Grassadonia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. First of all, let me thank uh, to the, the OIBR Foundation for the invitation to this important and prestigious uh, Congress. As a company, we are very proud to be here today and have the opportunity to explain our journey to the integrated reporting. So uh, if I can see the slide, uh, okay, I, a, couple, a couple of words on uh, the presentation of the company. CADF is a local public utility in the water service industry based in Codigoro, a province of Ferrara in the north of Italy. The business uh, is uh, to provide water services such as distribution of water to residences and the wastewater treatment. The infrastructure is owned by the 11 municipalities whose territories are served by CIDF, and the company is uh, not listed. We give services to an area of 1,300 square kilometers for about 105,000 inhabitants that become twice during the summertime. We have uh, 150 employees and that turn over uh, a little bit more than 30 million euros. So the company is uh, clearly an SME. We start preparing uh, sustainability reports from 2010 to 2015, and we produce integrated report in the 2019 today. So next slide, please. So why integrated reporting? The management find it uh, the right tool to improve the growth opportunities, embrace uh, sustainable development in a holistic perspective, enhance the cohesiveness of the organization and its management. I can tell we truly perceive this aspect during the process, foster the relationship with the stakeholders for transparency and think to the municipalities, which are actually the shareholders, the suppliers, the customers, and last but not least, bring more coherence in the visual stream of information generated by the company in response to the diversified request by the laws and the water authority, so-called in Italy, ARIRA. In Italy, as in many countries around the world, uh, the water service industry is strongly regulated and the authority uses to require uh, a large and very detailed amount of information, which takes a big effort to the company. Now, I'd like to outline some interesting details we have been working on to produce uh, integrated reporting. Uh, next slide. Here, the picture of the business model which helps to understand how much we deal with the environment and how many actors are involved in our business. The next one. We have the risk analysis, where we classify all the risks by category, such financial, strategic, and market risk, environmental, reputational, legal, operational, infrastructural. All these risks 
are related according to the SDGs. You can see the icon on the, on the right side. On the next one, then we improve the materiality analysis according to the IRC framework. Next. In particular, uh, once we have found the relevant matters which can affect the value creation, we evaluate their magnitude. So you can see the vertical axis the likelihood of occurrence, horizontal axis, and the third variable, the imminence of the event, showed by the size of the spheres. We differentiate, differentiate between the output and outcome to better explain the creating value process. And the next, according to the latest version of IRC framework, we put in plain words those charged with governance. So we mentioned the high-level cross-functional team that produced a unitary draft of the report, which is the result of an effort by all the company's departments. After this short tour, let's take a look of other details that enrich our integrated reporting. On the next slide, we can see the first integrated report in 2019 financial year. We refer to the IRC framework. We include the SASB standards for water utilities and services, so-called the IFWU. We refer to intangible reporting framework 2016, adding some generic sector agnostic KPIs by World Intellectual Capital Initiative, the Wiki. On the 2020 financial year, we had the, the GRI standards 101, 102, 103, that are the general, 302, 303, 306, that are the environmental specific for uh, energy, wa uh, water, and waste. And we applied on a voluntary basis the new financial statement according to the EU GER Directive 95-2014, first posed by the Administrative Decree 254-2016. So at this point, uh, somebody may ask, why do you apply all these standards? Moreover, for a small, medium enterprise, not even listed. I'll show you on the next, on the next slide why we are not crazy. Let's start from the substandard. As shown on the slide, we have found that there is a quite overlapping between the requested information by the Italian Regulatory Water Authority of ERA and the self-disclosure requirement for water services. I particularly wrote this table because it displays there are just few differences illustrated by the yellow and the red circle. This paves the way to the adoption of specialized KPIs globally comparable. To my modest opinion, it seems that uh, many Italian companies on the water service industry already use SASB but, uh, for uh, IFWU without even knowing it. You know. And going to the next slide, uh, we, walk, uh, we talk about the adoption of the no financial statement according to the 254 decree. Once again, I remember to the audience, we apply it on a voluntary basis. I like to highlight this because not many small medium enterprises made this choice so far in Italy. So we think the non-financial statement, it allows the company to fully express its actions on the associated consequences for natural and social capitals, here in the context of integrated reform. And more, GRI standards have been useful to provide appropriate metrics for energy, water usage, and waste management, as I just said before. Furthermore, we have uh, found uh, these GRI standards compatible in technical terms with the SASB standard FWU. And now to conclude the presentation, some remarks on the benefit and the challenges for the CADF. Next slide. Integrated reporting helped us strengthen our internal consistency at strategic and managerial level. This has led us to a better understanding between the functional teams and more cohesive approach towards the objective of becoming a net zero emission company by 2020. Integrated reporting served us also to enhance our credibility and reputation with banks, shareholders, and customers. We have measured the positive impact on stakeholder satisfaction, running a service to suppliers, customers, banks, and the 11 municipalities, which are the shareholders, by interviewing the mayor. In the, in the near future, CIRDF intends to, con uh, to continue this virtual path by bringing its comprehensive integrated reporting more and more down the national lines of the organization in order to favor the implementation of this sustainability and value creation strategy in its day-by-day -day practice. Echoing the IRC motto, we could say sustainable development through extending integrated reporting. So thanks, I have to have been on time schedule and I, I give you back the word. Well, uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Mr. Filippi. Uh, you showed us that uh, even a small or medium enterprise can uh, 
use uh, integrated reporting and SASB standards. So it's not impossible. So with this uh, uh, contribution, we close the round table and I am going to hand back uh, the floor to our dearest chairman, uh, Professor Anderson, Alessandro Lai. Up Thanks. to you. Thanks, Luca. Thanks very much for moderating this round table. Thanks to the, our panelists for their observation. We, we learn we have a lot to do, a lot to do in the future. And I would like to say that OIBR will be with you in helping everyone to, to, to do well this journey towards a more sustainable world, to implement sustainable standards, to create new ideas about sustainability to have new idea about sustainability reporting. And so to close our webinar, it's a pleasure of mine to give the floor to both Janine, both to Janine Guyot and to Stefano Zambon for their concluding remarks. So Janine and Stefano, you will have the floor. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it was a fascinating webinar. I want to thank all of the speakers, especially the organizations that sh that shared their reporting journeys. It was so, uh, so helpful to hear your perspectives. I just want to close with two things. And I think two themes that came through loud and clear. Um, one is that the Value Reporting Foundation is committed to being market-led and responsive to market feedback. And so uh, Lisa French talked about that when she talked about the due process on the revision of the integrated reporting framework. Likewise, um, the SASB standards, we're very committed for the SASB standards to be developed using market feedback. I would love to hear more input about why the two uh, metrics in the water utility standard, the two that weren't relevant, would love to hear more about that. That's the kind of feedback that we love to have because it just enables us to continue to improve the standard. So I just want all of you to know that for both the integrated reporting framework and the SASB standards, your feedback and your input is invaluable. And there are tools on our website to provide that feedback. The second theme I want to talk about is small and medium sized enterprises. I think we hear that loud and clear. We think the integrated reporting framework can be adapted for small and medium sized enterprises. You saw examples of that today. And we think the SASB standards are a very useful on ramp for small and medium sized enterprises because they cover the, a relatively small number of topics that are directly relevant to enterprise value. And in many cases are issues that companies are either already managing or should be managing uh, because they're connected to long-term value. So I'll just stop right there, um, but I can't thank um, Alessandro and Stefano, both of you, enough for hosting this webinar. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, uh, we, we thank you and the Value Reporting Foundation for such a valuable contribution for the Italian context. I think it's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for us, uh, as Alessandro pointed out. Uh, let me also uh, say that there's been a rich seminar in an hour and a half or, or a little more than that uh, views uh, and perspectives of what uh, is the present and the future of, uh, of all the sustainability reporting. Uh, I also would like to touch upon the fact that uh, integrated reporting clearly is flexible enough to be adapted to in very uh, sort of unexpected, uh, Laura Girella said, unexpected situations like, uh, you know, asylum seeker centers or the Italian Federation for Football or, or, or other situations like, they are like a stress test for the integrated reporting framework. Uh, another interesting thing is SMEs. I totally agree with Janine and it was, uh, you know, very loud, loud and clear. Uh, that SMEs are really one of the frontiers where, of course, we've been already working uh, very much on this. Um, we already published uh, guidance for SMEs for integrated reporting, for the application of integrated reporting, some KPIs as well. 
and and clearly this is uh, one of the major important elements for 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 Italians and for Italian of course uh, economic context. Uh, let, just to stress also a couple of other points that uh, uh, Laura Girella reminded us this intangibles are of course also important uh, if we want to talk about enterprise value I don't I don't think I have to convince uh, uh, Janine on this and so I think it's also very important that uh, uh, the contribution that the OIBR can offer together with the, 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 the weak and I think this intangibles are also a, a very it's very important that um, we consider very important that also the new proposed directive uh, encompasses also intangibles within their its scope and I think this also contributes to a more evolved um, a more sophisticated concept of sustainability uh, because, as Alessandro just said, because sustainability is about, of course, environment, it's about society, and that's no doubt about this, but it's, of course, about enterprise value, and enterprise value is nurtured by intangibles and, of course, the various other capitals that are included in integrated reporting. Clearly, all this, there's a lot of work to do. That is a <laughs> minimum common denominator of basically all the, all the speakers. There's a lot of work to do, like also Guglielmina Onofri said to us from concept perspective, and we can't agree more. Clearly, there's also uh, there's a develop, need for developing uh, concepts and languages to align concepts and languages um, because, of course, we come from a, an alphabet soup, as the, we call it minestrone, I think, in Italy, um, and uh, of, of uh, standards and framework providers. In this respect, let me conclude saying the OIBR Foundation would like to provide an an important, uh, um, uh, an important contribution as far as is possible. We are here to, of course, to, co to help and, of course, to collaborate. Uh, we would like to also to, to enter these processes even more and more because we are convinced that we can provide, uh, you know, we have a similar mind, you know, uh, and, and as a mindset. And then we would like to give uh, our contribution to international standardization uh, and in this respect uh, we really open uh, and uh, offer our availability to value reporting foundation and ifrs uh, uh, foundation to contribute uh, not only of course to european standardization which is kind of obvious being the g7 and only the european country but also to the, the international the wider the wider internationalization somehow we would like also to bring up the Italian voice to the Italian, to the you know to the world, to the global debate about this as such a fundamental issue for the, our development. So I think with this uh, with these words, I think we can I can conclude my conclusive remarks and about the conclusion okay. must be given to our okay. president. Thank you, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Janina. Thank again. you, Stefano. You have an angel on the wall, on the opposite of you, and you say we need to have many angels, and we have many angels helping us in doing our work, in getting our purposes, in getting our aims to provide some help and some ideas to all the firms, organizations, and also, if possible, authorities to, 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 to do better, to do better. So our, our next, next uh, meeting will be to introduce you the Italian translation of the uh, framework of the IRC of the integrated report. And so I give you, uh, I can say you, I will like to see you again in future, soon in the next webinar. So thank you very much to the panelists, to the speaker, and especially to those who woke up very early this morning because they live in California, I mean Janine and so on. Thank you to everyone and have a nice afternoon or an evening of night. It depends where you live. Bye bye, by Alessandro, by the organization of the OIBR. And thank you to Stefano for organizing this webinar. Bye bye. <laughs>